Okay, well, welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio, everyone. I'm Lori LeBay, the host and founder of Alzheimer Speaks. And before we get into our show today, which I know you're going to find fascinating, I always like to give our new listeners just a little background about us. Alzheimer Speaks is an advocacy based company which provides multiple platforms to shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort around the world. And we believe one of the best ways to do that is just uh, by joining forces and sharing knowledge and having these everyday conversations like we do on Alzheimer's Speaks Radio about dementia. Um, In doing so, we believe we're able to remove some of the stigmas and isolation that's attached to memory loss and help lift people to continue to live purpose-filled lives. At our core, um, we also believe that collaboration is the only way we're going to win this battle. And we have to give you just a huge hug out there and a big thank you because you guys have really helped spread the word of our work. See all of your likes, your clicks, your shares with your Facebook friends, your LinkedIn colleagues, your Twitter tribes, your Pinterest peeps um, is pushing information about dementia out there into the world. And, you know, we all feel more comfortable with something the more we hear about it, the more we see it. Um, it becomes the new normal. And we can't force people to jump into this arena. And most people don't until they're, they're really, you know, it hits their own home um, is when they <clears throat> start, uh, start trying to gather information. And a lot of times they're in crisis. So again, the more we can push information out there, the, just the easier it's going to be for people to grab. And hopefully we can shift that um, sense of reach so that people don't have to be in crisis to get educated about this disease. Um, So again, thank you, because again, with your shares, with your help, uh, you got us named as the number one influencer online regarding Alzheimer's, according to ShareCare and Dr. Oz, and we surely couldn't have done that on our own. So again, just a lot of gratitude going out to each and every one of you, and we hope that you will continue your support as well. Also want to mention that here on Alzheimer's Speaks, we like to hear everybody's voice. So if you are a person who is having some memory issues, um, maybe you have uh, been formally diagnosed, maybe you're caring for somebody, uh, maybe it's a, a coworker, maybe you're an employer trying to figure out how do I work with this um, with some of my employees or, or people who are caring for somebody with dementia. Maybe you're a researcher, maybe you've written a book or a movie in a play or an advocate. It doesn't make any difference. It takes all of us to um, voice our opinions to really help shift how we care. So reach out to me. I would be more than glad to talk with you about being a potential guest on the show. I'm going to have our co-hosts introduce themselves, and I'm thrilled to have both of them with us. Um, Each is one of my experts on Dementia Chats, which I'll just give a little plug for, which are video recordings that we do, and my panelists all have dementia. Um, So I'm going to go ahead and have, uh, Lori, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Lori Scher. I live in Pennsylvania, and in August of 2013, I was diagnosed with early-onset Alzheimer's and FTD, which is frontotemporal dementia. Okay, great. And our other co-host today is Susan. Susan, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, hi. My name's Susan Stutchen. I'm in Oklahoma, and I was diagnosed uh, about a dozen years ago with early onset Alzheimer, and then uh, about four years ago, with an additional diagnosis of uh, frontotemporal dementia and uh, primary progressive aphasia. Okay, great. Thank you both for joining us. And today 
we have an author with us, Kathleen Wheeler, and she is the author of a brand new book called Brought to Our Senses. I love that title. (laughs) And she writes uh, stories that really sing because she says she can't. She's a graduate of the University of Illinois, and she has been a wordsmith in marketing and communications professions for ad agencies and corporations since Nike first coined the slogan, Just Do It. Um, Kathy is a a music enthusiast and a lifelong fan of um, British-known, I'm going crazy here, British-known musician known by one syllable nickname who calls the land of Lincoln his home. And if any of our listeners know who that is, uh, feel free to go ahead and type that in our comment section. Um, Kathleen, welcome today. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here talking with you today, Lori, well, and I, also with you, Lori and Susan. Yeah, I think we're going to have a great conversation. Um, what I always like to start out with, uh, Kathy, is what what is your background in terms of um, dementia? You know, um, have you been personally touched by this? Oh, absolutely. My uh, mother had Alzheimer's, and it's pretty much the reason why I decided to write this book. It was a very difficult struggle for my siblings and I, uh, because she lived alone. She did not have a spouse, so um, it pretty much was up to us when she started progressing to help take care of her. Okay, and that's uh, that's pretty common, I think, in terms of you know how people get involved in this. And this whole whole thing we call dementia, this journey down this path, is people get touched and um, boom, <laughs> you know, you're just you're in it, in it for the long haul there. So that's that's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Now, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what inspired you, you know, to write the book? And I always like to find out from people how did you pick your title? And I think your title is brilliant. Okay. Well, I'll start first with telling you about myself and why I decided to write the book. I guess I'm your average Midwesterner Midwesterner living the dream to, uh, you know, write a book. I think a lot of people have that dream. Um, I loved to read as a kid, and that passion translated to love of writing when I got older. So after I graduated from college with a degree in communication, um, I worked um, in, in corporate marketing and for advertising agencies. So I was able to write commercially which was wonderful. That's what I wanted to do. Um, But I never really had a story of my own that was important to tell until my mother developed Alzheimer's. Um, That 13-year ordeal was such a struggle for my siblings and I that it pretty much inspired me to to write my first book, which is what became Brought to Our Senses. Um, it's, It's pretty much a labor of love, and I'm really proud of the story. And um, I, I think what I've been successful with that book in showing is the difficulty of dementia and how families need to come together to be able to deal with it together. Um, and as far as your other question, the title for your book, um, that pretty much goes back to um, my love of music. Um, I am a music enthusiast, and it's always been a big part of my life. So that title is actually adapted from a song by my favorite musician who you hinted at. That is Sting. He's actually not from the land. He's not, he's not from the land of Lincoln. I am, but, (laughs) but anyways, I am a big fan of his. So he has a song that's called, I was brought to my senses. And I love that song. And I kept hearing it playing as I was writing this story um, over many years. So it's a beautiful ballad and it talks about relationships that are broken and mended like the changing of the seasons and the the need to experience death to appreciate life more. So um, I thought it was appropriate to just adapt that to brought to our senses to deal with a family that that's going through this, this struggle and all being changed by it. Which makes a lot, a lot of sense. That's for sure. Um, I, I, cause I think that there's, uh, I know in my, my own journey with my mom, <clears throat> I feel like, uh, the life lessons she taught me really kind of brought me to my senses, you know, things that I thought should look one way or be one way. It was like, wow, it's almost like I was looking in the mirror, you know, in, in almost like a carnival mirror, you know, the rest of my life. Cause it was so black and white in terms of lessons learned, um, through, right. through the journey there. Um, Susan, do you have anything you want to add so far? 
Well, the what is struck me is that um, um, Sting, one of my favorites, I must add. <laughs> Yay! Um, me too. And I, I think that concept of um, seeing things from different perspectives, what we might assume can turn to be something completely different as we all navigate this journey that works on both sides of the table. Yep, exactly. Absolutely. Lori, anything that you would like to add? Just, it was interesting that you chose that song and that means so much to you because when I was diagnosed and I was suddenly at home, um, I never realized how much beauty I have in my home, the number of birds, the number of flowers. Um, and so uh, just the, the whole thing of I was brought to my senses, I had this beautiful property and beautiful nature that I never saw. And it was because of my, my journey with Alzheimer's that I began seeing there is so much beauty that we we just don't notice. We don't take time to notice. So that's a good song. Wonderful. Um, and Kathy, I'm going to ask you if you can share with our audience kind of what's the premise of your story. And is this, is this a story about your actual family or did you just use tidbits kind of towards it with names changed to protect the innocent? You know, what, what kind of book is it? Yes, I should, I should clarify that point. It is a fictional story. Um, it is a novel. Um, I, I do borrow from my mother's progression through Alzheimer's heavily, what happened, those kinds of things. Um, but I did make it into a fictional story to make it compelling, to, to, to make it be a, a read where you want to go from chapter to chapter and, uh, you know, kind of up the drama. So, um, the premise of it, in essence, is it's, it's a story about the importance of family and forgiveness. Um, it's the, and that's shown through the intersection of a dysfunctional family um, and Alzheimer's disease, which is obviously a preca- precarious crossroads. Um, and it, I, as I said, it based on it's based on my mother's progression through Alzheimer's and what I and my family learned from that journey. Um, I was inspired to write it as a novel by some other novels you're probably familiar with, Still Alice by Lisa Genova, and also We Are Not Ourselves by Matthew Thomas. Um, I just wanted it to be compelling and keep people hooked and, and wanting to read to to get through and kind of see what happens. So that's kind of how it's written. Okay, great. What types of um, themes do you set out to explore, you know, in the novel? Well, first and foremost, of course, family relationships. Um, That's the biggest theme and how fragile and complicated those bonds can be. Um, Divorce is also another theme that's running rampant through my story um, and how a messy breakup impacts all of the other family dynamics and how that relates to taking care of a parent when when you've got those kind of um, resentments and I think grudges from, you know, from childhood and from your upbringing. Um, Also, obviously, Alzheimer's disease is is a topic of focus, uh, I'm sorry, a topic of focus, um, specifically the chaos surrounding the illness and its influence and how it can influence already strained uh, relationships. And I think um, finally, it, the book uh, is about forgiveness as a theme, um, how it's possible to make amends with family by looking at conflicts from a different perspective and, and forgiving and being able to forgive based on that maybe new perspective. Okay. Um, and those are all big, big topics. Um, each, each, Absolutely. One, each one of those. Um, why don't we, can we talk a little bit about each of those topics? Can you kind of break them down for us and maybe give us a little sampling? Sure. As far as, um, I guess maybe starting with family relationships, the book focuses on four siblings, um, four adult children, who are um, from a family of divorce. So um, the divorce happened when they were all much younger. So these are siblings that are not very close. Um, And so when the mother, when it becomes obvious that the mother is developing Alzheimer's, she's on her own. Three of the siblings are close by, one is not. However, you know, it becomes very apparent in the story that, that they're going to have to step in and take care of her because she 
is in denial. She won't admit there's a problem. So um, they, they are, they're not very close, but they're going to have to come together and talk to each other to try to figure out what to do here. So um, I, I think there's uh, some fi- family dynamics going on where there's there's the protagonist of the story. Her name is Elizabeth, who is, of course, the, the favorite child, the one that the mother liked best and, and pretty much didn't have any problem, you know, showing that. So everybody obviously knows it. There's the the son who's very successful, but he's moved away. So he's very far away. So it's very difficult for him to help. And then there's two middle daughters that are close by, but they aren't as close with their mother. So obviously they're not as willing to want to help out because they, you know, they have resentments from growing up from not being the favored kid. So those are kind of some of the family relationships and dynamics that are going on. And obviously when there's a crisis in this story and they have to come together and work, well, everyone's going to go back to those resentments and the, the, the way they behaved and they felt as kids, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and that's, uh, those are some pretty, pretty interesting dynamics. Um, what about, you know, your other categories for, for themes? Can you break those down a little? Sure. Divorce. Um, I've kind of already hit on that. Um, you know, the divorce was very hard on this family when they were young. And so the, there is no father. He's moved away. So it's pretty much the mother trying to raise these children in, in, in a very difficult situation as far as not much money. And, uh, you know, they're, they're all not getting the same amount of attention. Um, so the divorce plays in it that way. Um, my other topic, I believe, was Alzheimer's disease. So that's, um, that's, you know, pretty much running throughout the whole story is that's, you know, how are they going to help their mother when she won't accept the help and she's continuing to book us and get worse. Mm-hmm. And um, the last one, forgiveness, I think this story takes place over 13 years, her 13 year um, progression through dementia. So, I mean, at the beginning they had there, there's a lot of fighting. They have a lot of difficulty coming to agreement on how best to care for her. Um, Some of them don't want to be so involved and they'd rather see her go into a nursing home right away. The youngest child, obviously who, uh, who was the favored child and is very close to her mother, of course, does not want to place her in the facility. She wants everyone to try to work to keep her at home. Um, so that's going on. And But as it progresses over the years, and eventually she, they are forced to place her in a nursing home because she's, um, she's a very difficult patient and she's not going to let anyone take care of her. So it kind of comes in the story. It, it's out of their hands. Um, she does have to be placed in a nursing home. And I think over that progression of watching her continue to decline is when they all start thinking about the perspectives of each other and their, the way they were raised and the things that they were happened. And everyone kind of starts to understand more that they were just doing the best they could under the circumstances and that perhaps it would be best to forgive. And I think you know, seeing this life and death situation helps them to forgive each other and then move on to a place where they can all have a better relationship for themselves. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Lori, do you see in, in terms of what she's explaining in her book being um, fairly relevant in today's society in terms of what families deal with? Absolutely. Um, I think that you, you touch on so many concepts that do impact a family. Um, stress with people fighting stress is uh, definitely a huge factor and therefore people coming together is so important Um, and although we haven't had a family breakup I've heard from many others how much a divorce situation impacts somebody with dementia I mean it impacts people anyway but when you have dementia and you're not sure why that person's no longer around it, it sounds like you've hit on so many things that can have a major impact on the whole realm of of dementia disease. Yeah, sounds like a very exciting book. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Susan, anything that you want to add? Yeah, I think um, what stands out to me and is applicable um, uh, is the comment you made um, that everyone, um, regardless of what they bring to the table and the family dynamic, um, I hear this often, is that everybody's trying to do the best that they can. Um, or, or they've always thought that's what they were doing um, with a perception that changes when the dynamic of Alzheimer's is introduced. Um, the expectations from family members um, that uh, we may have perceived um, and how that can change when uh, dementia is introduced. Um, I think those dynamics are um, very, very real and witnessed. Um, sometimes hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, so I think that dynamic is part of the um, for a lack of better word, the confusion with the job of being a, a care partner. I would, I would Absolutely. agree. Yeah, everyone reacts differently, and everybody takes different time to to adjust to maybe a new reality. And you know, um, I think that applies not only to maybe dementia caregiving, but pretty much you know, any and all situations or crises that might develop within a family. Yeah. Can you tell us, can you tell us, uh, Kathy, in the book, who was your favorite character and why? Well, I I think it would probably have to be the main character who's Elizabeth because um, she pretty much wears her heart on her sleeve. She, she's very close with her mother and she, um, she may have a flaw of, seeing things in black and white, right and wrong, but she does love her mother very much and wants to do what's best to take care of her. So she's trying to rally the troops to do this. And of course, they don't all agree on, on, you know, what exactly is the best care. Um, The mother in the story, her name is Janice, and she, her, uh, her illness um, manifests um, in pretty much paranoia, hostility, aggression, Um, which is how it manifested in my mother as well. So it becomes very, very difficult for them to do anything for her because she will not accept any help. She won't let anyone get near her finances. She won't sign a power of attorney. She keeps threatening to, you know, move away if, if everyone won't, you know, just leave her alone basically. So um, in that kind of a situation, you're pretty much got your back up against the wall um, and part of this story is that the these siblings have to get legal guardianship because she will never grant anyone power of attorney. She'll never admit that she has a problem. Um, so, you know, there's that stress and the, the crisis building um, where, you know, they it, it, it comes to a point where they really just can't take care of her because she won't let them. Okay. <clears throat> and in, in your own real life, it was that... Um... We, yes, we did have to, we did have to get legal guardianship. So, and, you know, that's very, very difficult situation. Um, You can't just go to a judge and say, they have dementia, we need to take over, you know, you have to prove it, they have to be certain people have, you know, rights, you can't just take things away from people. So, um, in my mother's case, she, she was very good at hiding it for a very long time. And, she had coping mechanisms where she just didn't talk to people for very long. She didn't stick around very long. So it was hard for people who didn't know her well to understand that there was a problem Mm -hmm. um, because she was very good at hiding it. So, um, you know, I used that, our experience getting legal guardianship and basically having to wait until there was something very serious that happened that was documented before we could go to a judge and be granted legal guardianship. Yeah, that's a and that's part of the story as well. Yeah, that's a very tricky thing to to maneuver. 
Um, and it, it's not a quick process and it's not an easy process um, to go through. I'm just going to throw out to, yeah. um, <clears throat> to Susan, have you known of anyone who has gone through that process? Yes, I, I, I do. And um, it is, as you said, it's terribly uh, frustrating and, and uh, unfortunate that it takes um, some form of a tragedy before um, y- your voice can be heard. Um, right. It's also just as tragic for the person that's been in denial, um, who's been walking a tightrope for <laughs> whoever knows how long, um, to realize um, that it's that thing of does it show? Um, it, well, it does. And to the point that uh, someone's hurt or the finances are gone or there's a, a like you say, a tragedy, and that we wait in those circumstances. I believe in the um, ability to stay independent as long as possible. Um, But there's this thin line um, that is hard to detect sometimes between safe and unsafe, um, wise and unwise. Um, and it really takes uh, a toll on the family to discern when does that line have to be crossed. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I cannot imagine having personally to be in the position. Yeah, right. It's difficult to know, you know, you need to step in because your 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 parents going to be hurt or someone else is going to be hurt you know you have to to weigh all those back and forth and wait i mean obviously you know you want people to have their independence as long as possible but you also don't want to be responsible if something bad happens um you know especially to someone someone else who's an innocent bystander and has no idea what's going on Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was hard. In our case, we I think we waited more than a year. We went to an elder care attorney who, you know, made us understand the situation. And um, basically he said, you're not at a point right now where I'm sure that a judge would grant you guardianship because, you know, she's very, very much able to conceal this. And so he said, wait. And so we waited and she got lost in a car and and we, it was documented by the police. She was um, babbling and just co- so confused when they found her um, that it was very easy to use that document from the police to go say, you know, we need to step in now so mm-hmm. that she does, this doesn't happen again. And that's really scary to have to wait for something to happen, <clears throat> I think, for for all sides, you know, it's just, right. um, you know, we're, I think by nature, we want to avoid those crises. And, and yet when you really can't do anything until one hits, that's, that's very, very difficult, very, very difficult to do. Lori, any comments that you have regarding um, guardianship? Well, I haven't experienced the guardianship issue yet, but I, I'm sure that has that has got to be just horrible. But it was interesting hearing you talk about how well she had learned to hide her symptoms because from a positive note, many of us learn to do that to maintain our independence. But on the flip side, that has to be hard for <laughs> in when it progresses, that has to be hard to deal with. I do have a question off of that, though, if I may, Lori. Sure. I, I would love to know, how did your family perceive the book and did they try to find which character you were pegging after them and how did they <laughs> take to the book? <laughs> they, they, they liked it very much. They all thought that, you know, it could, it could help people. It could inspire people to get through this kind of a situation with their own families. And so they were, they were, had very positive feedback and said, you know, you should publish this and, and, you know, situations, names, places, everything has changed. I, I do borrow mostly from my mother's progression, but, you know, 
the 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 characters they they are their own characters. Mm-hmm. Well, so it's not other family mm-hmm. members. They weren't trying to figure out who which one was them. No, no. Okay, good. Yeah, and I and I do think that that happens a lot um, with people who are um, doing a book that is similar to their family situation. I've talked with a lot of authors because uh, it's kind of a common thread and about how do families feel. And some some have said, you know, my family hasn't liked that I'm doing this book because they're still in denial, <laughs> you know, that, right. that that anything really happened. And then others can be just so supportive. So I think it, it's something that really can vary from, you know, person to person and family to family. And that's that's just kind of part of it. Um, right. So, but, but great question, Lori. Um, <clears throat> as far as your, your book and, you know, the way it's, um, laid out and designed, uh, can you tell us, um, what you feel is unique about that? I don't know, um, cause I don't have a physical copy of it, but sometimes people have chosen to use bigger print or, um, bigger margins or, um, you know, different headers or things. And, and again, I know that this isn't a self-help book. This is a, this is a novel. Um, but is there anything like that? Um, I don't think there's anything physical that makes it different, but I think the way I've written there, there's some things that I think make it unique by the way I wrote it. Um, going back to my love of music and borrowing from Sting song for the title, I, I have also, included what I'd like to call a built-in soundtrack to the book, courtesy of Sting. Um, I kind of wanted to make it a soundtrack to add emotional depth through music, kind of like if you were watching a movie. And I've done that um, by, there's 19 chapters in the book. And each chapter is titled after a song by Sting. And then, and it, and then there's uh, some lyrics at the beginning of each chapter as well, that kind of hints of the drama that's about to unfold. So I kind of like to think as a substitute or a built-in soundtrack, and I would hope that maybe people who might be familiar with some of those songs might hear some of that music playing while they're reading. So that's one unique thing about it. Um, Also, we've already touched on one of the other things that I find unique about the book, and that's that it discusses legal guardianship and just what exactly that entails. Um, I've read quite a few books fictional and nonfiction and have never come across another story that really delves into legal guardianship and what's that that's like. So um, that's def- definitely something in my book that's, that's explained. Also um, another thing that I think makes my book unique is um, the fact that my story goes through the full journey of Alzheimer's before the, the um, Janice is the, the mother who um is diagnosed with Alzheimer's and you learn about this character from her childhood, what her childhood was like before she was diagnosed, what happened um, in there with the family and her divorce when she's younger through her diagnosis and then up past through the end when she actually passes and how that affects the family. Um, A lot of the fictional books I've read kind of stop about midway and they don't get the whole way through it. So I kind of wanted to make sure that I told that whole story, the full journey. So um, that's something that I consider unique about the story as well. Okay. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Um, Now, as far as your book, because you just, you just launched this, correct? Yes. It it was just released November 1st. Okay. Okay. And um, have you been doing book signings and things or? I have. I've actually, um, I'm helping to raise money locally for um, some of the organizations here in Illinois that help support um, dementia patients and family caregivers and research to find a cure. So I've had some book signings with the Alzheimer's Association, which was really fun. Um, we brought a lot of people out and, and got to talk to a lot of people and raise some money for the local Alzheimer's Association, which is the Greater Illinois chapter um, of the Alzheimer's Association. Um, I also had a book signing at an event that was held by the Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. They have a clinic that's called the Center for Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders. And um, I was at, it was a um, Alzheimer's awareness program seminar that they held on a Saturday morning. And I was there and got to sell copies of my book with um, proceeds to go to the um, Alzheimer's clinic to help with their efforts as well. Oh, cool. 
That's that's wonderful. Um, yeah, I definitely hope to continue doing those kinds of things. That was one of my goals with the book. It's also to give back and to help other families and Alzheimer's patients and to, you know, help help with those efforts. So um, I definitely plan to continue doing that. Okay. Now, um, are you planning on doing or have you done already some speaking at all with, uh, you know, with the associations or other groups? I have not. Um, I haven't haven't tried that yet. I'm not opposed to it, but um, I, I'm much more of a writer than a speaker. So okay. um, we'll have to see how that goes. I haven't been asked to do that yet. Um, okay. So no, not not to not into this point. Okay. Okay. Well, I just thought I would would check in and see on that. Um, Lori, do you have any questions that you would like to ask Kathy? Um, no, I, I think you've asked them all, but I, I do think the book sounds very exciting and very interesting, and I am just thrilled that you're giving back so much um, through your your writing, your book signings, engagements. Kudos to you. That's That's wonderful that you're doing that. Thank you. Yes, I've really enjoyed it so far, and it just just makes it all so much more worthwhile to be able to help others who are dealing with the same kind of issues. Great. Um, Susan, any questions you'd like to pose to Kathy? Yeah, Kathy, I'm curious. Um, Working on a project myself in a different format, um, I'd be curious to hear from you in writing the book, um, although be it fictional, um, was that um, an easier task because you had experienced what of you wrote, or was it um, difficult or mm, might I say cleansing? Um, therapeutic, maybe. <laughs> Absolutely, the word. I think, thank right. you. Yes. Yeah therapeutic absolutely I think writing the book helps you you know um, to work through that the struggle the experience it was 13 years and it was very very difficult on my family and and also on me so um, I think being able to write about it and hopefully inspire others to be able to get through that journey as well is is definitely um, a goal achieved and definitely very therapeutic for me. <laughs> Yeah, I think most most authors will say that, you know, the writing process is, is extremely therapeutic and, um, and very healing, not just for them, but they find from those that read um, their works as well, that it just, it helps, it, it, you know, it's just kind of that extension thing of I'm not in this alone anymore and somebody else gets it. Um, right. that's just a, just a huge, huge piece, um, when someone can communicate in, you know, if it's in writing or if it's, you know, out speaking or doing film or whatever it is, um, you know, those are all different platforms that can just, um, be very healing and educational for all sides, uh, involved with that, I think. So absolutely wonderful. Um, what do you think would be the most important um, thing that your readers will learn from your book brought to our senses? Well, I, I hope that it will help people to to realize that family means everything. Um, maybe a reader might recognize that they, they need to give maybe their siblings or relatives a break and reconsider their family history from a more compassionate and forgiving light. Um, and I said it before, I think most people behave the best, the best they can under difficult circumstances and hurtful things happen for reasons that are maybe hard to understand from your own selfish, selfish perspective. Um, so I, I think maybe in reading the book, people hopefully might be able to, to reconsider things and, and understand, yeah, okay, maybe maybe I need to, maybe I need to say I'm sorry or, or be forgiving or reach, just reach out and reestablish relationships with family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's not always, uh, not always easy to do for many, many families. Um, Absolutely not. It's like, I'm sorry is two words, but sometimes it's really hard for people to say that. 
Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, there's there's a lot of judging that can go on in this process, needless to say, and and um, yeah. can really pull pull families apart in a, in a lot of ways. Um, Lori, any other questions that you want to pose or ideas that you have? Other than I would imagine you want to know where you can get the book because you keep saying it sounds like an interesting book. <laughs> Uh, I can tell you that the book is available from all major online booksellers um, as a paper book, paperback and an ebook. Um, you can get it on Amazon, on barnesandnoble.com. You can get it on iBooks. Um, you could certainly ask for it at Barnes and Noble, uh, and they could order it for you. Um, but it is available online as well. Um, if you just search for "brought to our senses." you'd certainly be able to find it there. And um, for any more information on the book, um, there is a website. It's brought to our senses.com. And you can find out more information on me there as well. Okay, wonderful. Well, I, uh, I appreciate your time with us today. I think this was an interesting conversation. The book looks very intriguing. And um, I, I hope... Uh, that some of you listening will go and purchase that and see what you think. It's got, again, some great points with uh, family and guardianship and divorce and, I mean, just the dynamics of really living with the disease and um, all the little extra tidbits that can come up to cause different twists and turns because, you know, we always say, you know, when you've met one person with dementia, you've met one. Well, then, you know, add a family into the mix. And it's really a very unique <laughs> situation. And I, I think sometimes as a society, we don't value how as much as we are similar, we are extremely different in terms of where we're coming from and how we've been brought up and what our dynamics and priorities are that all affect how we care for one another. And um, I, I think that that's a real important piece that, that needs to seriously be looked at and considered um, because, again, um, we're not going to get through this life alone. And, uh, you know, we do need one another and figuring out who, who's going to be in our life and what role they're going to have at one point. Um, it's really worth a conversation a ahead of when we need it in a crisis. Um, but few have that conversation. Uh, because it's so uncomfortable. So, you know, maybe a book like this will urge some families to have a conversation. So I thank you for that, Kathleen. Thank you. That was very well stated. I appreciate it, you having me on your show today, Lori. And it was also very nice to speak with you, Lori and Susan. Thank you for your time today as well. Yeah, they just, thank you, Kathleen. their additional voices are just, I think, so important um, in terms of their perspective you know, on things. Um, I, I would like to ask um, Lori and Susan one last question in terms of, do you have any advice, and I'll give this to Susan first, any advice for family members of how would you like to be treated or how would you like it to be handled if, if guardianship was ever a need? Hmm. Well, I was the one after diagnosed who um, chose my uh, POA. Uh, I have two. Um, I handled everything. Um, so, and I did that because I'm kind of a bossy person and I wanted <laughs> control over <laughs> the choices. Uh, and, <laughs> um, I have been very clear and it's an ongoing conversation because the disease and life circumstances continue to evolve so it's always an ongoing conversation of where are we now who's still in and who needs to take a break so to speak um, have roles changed based on the realities that were once just perception. Mm -hmm. um, at some point or another, um, I think I will always be able to discern. I may not be able to articulate it verbally. 
And that is our discussion as of late. What do we do uh, when no maybe can speak? Um, So I continually um, uh, write what I think would be best in the event that I became more than anyone could truly handle um, compassionately so that they are not in that position um, to question their decisions. Uh, My goal is that the no have any regret or doubt. So my advice and what has worked for me, um, and we trip along the way, trust me. Um, Just because I say it so does no mean they all like. Uh, So um, there's conflict with those, but dialogue Mm -hmm. as things mm, progress, as people change as uh, everything there's so many considerations um, and being willing to ask for that help is not real understand Um, I think I always go back to it takes a village and um, you clearly start to realize who is on your team and who isn't Mm -hmm. so keeping your team informed, educated, and uh, giving them a voice, I think helps immensely. Well, and I like the fact you're just talking about developing that team and and taking control of it ahead of time. You know, um, I think that that's really important. As soon as, you know, we, uh, as soon as we're aware of an issue, we should be jumping on it. But, you know, in all honesty, we should really, as a society, have these things in place when we turn 18 and we don't, we don't have these conversations. We think everybody's, you know, going to live just fine, but you know, life happens. And, um, yeah, this is big stuff. How about you, Lori? Any thoughts? Are you there, Lori? I'm sorry. I didn't realize I had it on mute. That's okay. (laughs) Um, I, my husband and I took care of that like right away. Um, we met with an elderly care attorney um, after about a year, and I had documented everything I wanted. I took away from him total power to decide my end of life or my be- being put into a care facility. And the reason is I feel that he would probably try to keep me longer than he should, which would not be healthy for him. Um, so there's three people that will majority rules make a decision when when I go into a home as well as when you don't resuscitate. And I, for anybody out there that's been diagnosed, even though you're in early stages, I would encourage that. Take the burden off your family. Uh, to have to go through what Kathy went through is just, uh, that's hard for the family. It, 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 just, it needs to be done early. It needs to be done before that. Mm-hmm. Um, if uh, I kind of think like with Susan, if you really if you really love your family, do it now while you have a say. Currently, I have a say in what's going to happen. So now's the time for me to use my voice and make that determination. Mm-hmm. Not when it's too late. Uh, I can't imagine what what it does to a family having to go through court and do all that. That's just very hard. The other thing I'd like to say is my husband's very good at covering things up, so I think I'm making the decision, and I'm I'm really not. But <laughs> he he allows me to think I'm doing things or think I'm making a decision um, when uh, he he just very nicely turns it around. So I really think I did that. Mm-hmm. I. Sometimes later, it find out like, that I. I was going to say that just sounds like a man who loves you. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, 
Yeah, and uh, that's a good way to handle it when you have somebody, if you can take a situation and turn it around so instead of saying you can't do it anymore, let them think they did it. Give them fake checks. Let them write the fake checks, whatever, um, to be able to feel useful, even if you're not. That comfort of feeling as though you're doing it yourself is just real important. Yeah. Right. Uh, going back to the keeping your independence as long as you can or trying. Yeah. Yep, definitely. Well, wonderful, ladies. Thank you so much. Uh, Kathleen, I'll give you one last thing. If there's um, anything else that you want to share about your book that we forgot. And um, also, please uh, give one more time how people can reach you and get your book. Okay. Um, I think we covered things pretty well. Thank you. Thanks again to all of you. Uh, as far as where the book is available, it's available at all major online booksellers, Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com. You can get it as a paperback or an ebook. Um, also from, did I say iBooks? I, I can't remember if I said that. Um, and uh, the website to get more information about the book or me is just brought to our senses.com. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you all again for, for being part of the show. I think this is a, a great conversation. Uh, for our listeners, if you're new to our network, which is Alive and Social, I would encourage you to check us out. We have lots of great shows. Um, one I'm just going to highlight is called What's for Dinner Tonight, and it's a, it's a short podcast, only 10 to 15 minutes per episode, but it's perfect when you're busy and you're hungry and you need a little assistance making dinner plans. And each episode ends with an easy, delicious, seasonal meal, and um, the hosts are Rachel Perrin, who is a culinary director for Kowalski's Markets here in Minnesota, along with her producer and sidekick, um, Adam Lee. And they talk with fantastic uh, food uh, friends and colleagues, and they chat about seasonal flavors and favorite foods and trending topics and nutrition and kind of everything yummy for your tummy. You can also find their menus uh, listed on Kowalski's.com, and that's K-O-W-A-L-S-K-I-S dot com. That's K-O-W-A-L-S-K-I-S dot com. Um, also, I want to just point out for those of you that are new, um, check out our resource directory on alzheimerspeaks.com. And if you've got a resource you would like to input there, um, reach out to me and I can uh, share with you how that is done. It is uh, free of cost. We also want to point out that all of our radio shows are archived. So you can go back and listen. We've had a couple of them recently on music therapy that have been just really great, um, along with the memory cafes and, um, and a family that was touched by dementia and honoring their father in their community down in Tennessee um, developed um, a new um, housing concept for people with dementia called Abe's Garden, which is just fabulous. We also here at Alzheimer Speaks um, have a platform called Dementia Chats, and uh, both Lori and Susan are part of our, our panelists, our experts. In our last conversation, we talked about caring for pets, and is it really a good fit? And they gave some really good ideas about having a family pet versus even visiting a pet and the effects that that can have on somebody with dementia. And I think uh, a lot of things we overlook um, we always look at the kind of fuzzy, good feeling side, but there's some other factors that I think should be considered, and they have just a wonderful insights with that. On the blog, um, you'll find um, a couple of recent posts. One is called Gratitude and Grace for the Holidays, just a short little post that you might be interested in. Um, you'll also see something about um, Maria Shriver's Sunday paper uh, which I was lucky enough to be highlighted as an architect of change. And I'll be posting another one uh, where I was interviewed for Media Planet, just did this big expose um, in the paper, and it's now available online. So I'll get that out for everybody because it was just, I just have a small portion in this in this big section. Um, but they they just have a lot of great voices in terms of what they are doing um, for dementia as a whole. So in the meantime, you guys have a great week and um, have, a, have, you know, have a wonderful holiday season because it is definitely here and in gear and stay safe. And keep some of the tips in mind um, that we talked about on our last show about holidays in terms of 
having small, smaller, smaller gatherings and watching the environment, um, both um, for a lot of items that we have in terms of um, clutter, which we call decorations, um, and lighting, um, temperature control, sound, all of those types of things. And um, I think that might be uh, another show that you want to uh, check out while we're in the midst of things. In wrapping up, I just want to um, encourage you also to join Alzheimer's Speaks and go ahead and get some of our um, free tools, one of which is called Your Memory Chip. And it teaches us, instead of being focused so much and, and being so driven by our checklist, to focus on is a person with dementia safe, happy, and pain-free? Because it changes how we complete our tasks. Have a great holiday season. We'll talk to you all soon. Thanks, everyone. It's time to rethink, renew, and reimagine retirement. Hey, everybody. Jared Sebesta here, host of Retire Repurposed. Now, this podcast is about the non-financial parts of retirement, which many times can be even more challenging than the financial. We believe retirement is not the end, rather the beginning of what could be the most impactful, purposeful, and fulfilling season of a person's life. So don't retire. Become repurposed. To listen now, search Retire Repurposed on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.